What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that helps investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens get an edge by equipping themselves with the knowledge needed to anticipate the challenges and opportunities of tomorrow. By sharing my critical thinking approach and by challenging consensus narratives about the power structures shaping our world, I help you make the connections to see the bigger picture, empowering you to make smarter decisions. On this week's episode, I speak with Toby Ord, a senior research fellow in philosophy at Oxford University and author of The Precipice, a book which focuses on the big picture questions facing humanity, our long-term future, and the risks which threaten to put a premature end to our existence. At first glance, devoting one's life to the study of existential risks might seem a bit depressing. After all, who wants to spend their days thinking about all the different ways in which humanity could finally meet its end? But the more I read of Toby's book, the more I realized that his work is, at its core, a meditation on why we should care in the first place about whether or not we survive as a species. And I never really considered that question before. In fact, I've often wondered if the world wouldn't be better off without us. After all, so much suffering has come about in this world precisely because of our presence, because of our actions and the indulgence of our inflated egos and capacities for total destruction. And yet, when I really sat down to think about it, when I imagined what I would feel knowing that I or my children or grandchildren or even great-grandchildren will be the last humans to ever see a sunrise or wonder at the mystery of creation, I felt a sense of tragedy. The purpose of today's conversation is first to get you to reflect on this question of whether or not humanity in our future is worth fighting for, and second, to reflect on what that means in terms of human action, politics, and global cooperation. What are the existential risks that we face as a species? How do we calculate those risks? Where do we focus our attention? How do we prioritize? And finally, what can we do to mitigate those risks that we deem worthy of our attention? This is both a philosophical but also a practical conversation. For those primarily interested in our discussion about existential risk, that part begins about 40 minutes in, where we spend the balance of the regular episode discussing the threat of nuclear war and the geopolitical dimensions that escalate its likelihood. The overtime is spent primarily discussing the risks posed by both natural and engineered pandemics, biological terrorism, and artificial intelligence. It's a fascinating and thought-provoking conversation. So without any further ado, please enjoy this week's episode with my guest, Toby Ord. Toby Ord, welcome to Hidden Forces. Well, it's great to be here. It's great having you on. I just finished reading your book last week. What an amazing thing to devote your life to, looking at uh, existential risks. I'm curious, how did you get into this? Like, what, what is your background exactly? Yeah, I have a background in science, uh, especially computer science. But then I switched into philosophy through a kind of uh, overlap of logic, but also into moral philosophy, which is what I what I cared about most. I really wanted to do what I could in order to make the world a much better place. And I, I first got interested in that uh, really through global poverty and seeing how you know there are a billion people or more you know, without the basic necessities of life. And uh, there's kind of striking situation where we could do so much to improve their lot. So I was really interested in that and and in these global challenges, like, you know, what are the, the biggest issues in the world? And then how do we grapple with them? And, and how should we as individuals embrace them in our lives? So you're at the Future of Humanity Institute, right? Yeah, at Oxford. <laughs> How many people there also share a similar background? Because I know, well, I don't know for sure that Nick Bostrom studied philosophy or in particular moral philosophy, but so many of the questions that he grapples with in his work and in his book, Superintelligence, which I also recommend to listeners, deal with questions of philosophy, values, morality, and intersecting, of course, with computer science. So I'm curious about that. 
Yeah, Nick and I have uh, pretty similar backgrounds on this. Uh, he studied, I think he studied, <laughs> you know, seven different majors or something at university. He, he basically did everything. But we're often people who really care about big picture questions. That's probably the key. And then also we're really interested in technology. And I think most people here at FHI were very excited about technology. We certainly can see all the power of technology to transform our lives and that if it's used well, it can have just these tremendously good effects. But over time, we've also realized more and more that there is this other side to it and that trying to get all the good things without the bad aspects is really the key and that's our focus. So your book is titled The Precipice and the subtitle is Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity. How long were you working on this book and was there any particular reason that you wanted to write it beyond that it was simply the culmination of years and years spent on these issues? And what do you mean by the precipice? So I was working on the book itself for three years before uh, submitting the final manuscript back in, uh, in 2019. It ended up coming out just as the pandemic hit. But while I talk about pandemics in there, it's all from the pre-COVID era, but I, but I think it holds up pretty well. And I started thinking about this a long time earlier, about 16 years ago in 2004, when I was at Oxford and uh, Nick Bostrom had also got here at a very similar time. And uh, we got talking and he had just been uh, developing these ideas around existential risk, which is a broadening of the idea of extinction risk. So human extinction would not only destroy our present, but curtail our entire future. So that is a key issue, which I'm sure we're going to come back to. But there are other types of catastrophes that could have a similar effect. For example, if there was a collapse of civilization that was a lasting collapse that was unrecoverable, then similarly, it would destroy humanity's future potential. So he got thinking about this class of risks and how they have these unique features. And he, you know, talked to me about that and, and I got interested. I was uh, still working on global poverty and, and would be for another 10 years after that. But it, it kind of got bitten by this bug of, hang on a second, if this is a serious issue, if this is real, then this could be extremely big. It's hard to get bigger than the entire future of humanity being destroyed. The question is, is that a, a topic one can actually work on and make progress on? And, and over the years, I found that it was. And so I kind of kept that sidetrack in my studies. And then over about the last uh, 10 years, it started to play a more and more major role in really thinking deeply about this. Has the field meaningfully expanded since you entered it? And like, what did it look like before you got into it? How many people were working on these types of problems? It's very difficult to, to give precise estimates. I would say the main reason for that is that it's it's hard to know what counts as working on existential risk. For example, there's a large community of, of academics and people in civil society who are working to fight nuclear war, you know, have been working on nuclear disarmament treaties, you know, for many decades, and also people working on climate change. And these are both areas that are existential risks, even though most of the work that goes on them is not really directed to them, you know, as existential risks, but just as very large looming issues for humanity, whether they are risks of permanent ruin or just everyday catastrophes of other sizes. So it's very difficult, although I think we can safely say that the world spends less on preventing existential risk than it does on ice cream. So it's, it's not something that the world is taking particularly seriously. And the number of people who are really looking at it as a unified area of existential risk is probably a few dozen. So is that because of the sort of game theoretic dynamics associated with trying to address something like this, that it's a, a tragedy of the commons, so to speak? So that is a, a reason why it's underinvested in by national governments. For example, the UK, where I'm based, has only about 1% of the world's people in it. And so only 1% of the, the damages of some nuclear war or other disaster that could destroy humanity would actually be felt here. So when it comes to weighing up how much it's worth to spend to lower that risk, they would tend to undervalue it by a factor of 100 compared to what it's really worth. And that is a, 
a kind of tragedy of the commons between different countries that needs to get sorted out. We would all benefit if we all made commitments, but we kind of don't want others to free ride by being more careful about risks. So that is a challenge, but I don't think that's the reason why it doesn't have that many people working on it yet. I think that the reason is more that it's quite a recent idea and that a lot of the people who are working on nuclear war, certainly not all of them, but there's a substantial number who are working on it precisely because it threatened the whole future of humanity. And there was even you know, work done in ethics, uh, but it was called nuclear ethics because they only had one existential risk that they were thinking about. And so it all kind of got bundled into that category. And it's only more recently that we have noticed that climate change in its most extreme possibilities could also pose an existential risk. And that there's kind of a, a large number of these things, also natural risks such as asteroid impacts, which were only confirmed as something that killed the dinosaurs in 1980. So it's again, really quite recent. And the idea of nuclear winter, the mechanism whereby nuclear war could destroy humanity, it was only in 1983 that that was really discovered. So this is all quite recent. And I think that if you look at nuclear and if you look at climate, there has been an upswell of, of interest, both in, in academia and also among the general public. But in both cases, it took decades after the discovery and really the confirmation that these things were big risks before it really became something that people were taking seriously. And I think that one reason we need a, a united approach to existential risk in general, not just a separate community for each risk as they come up, is that we may not have decades in some of these other cases from the realization that this really does pose a threat to humanity till the times we, we have to have acted. Hmm. Yeah, and that raises... The a number of things that you said raised the issue of prioritization. And I think that's one of the big practical takeaways from the book. And one of the things that I want people to think about as we talk about it, which is that so much of the value of what you've done is to help focus our, our attention on where we can make the biggest difference, also where the impact of the risk is greatest, the probability associated, et cetera. Before we do that, I guess I have one more question, which is how much alignment is there between what you define as existential risks and risks that people think about whose outcomes are so bad that even though they wouldn't kill all of us, we just don't want that to happen under any circumstance. Because I think that's yeah. how most people think about like those types of cataclysms. Yeah. I think this is something that's it's very difficult to think about there's so many things that, I mean, if in your own life that kind of max out your ability to care about something being even worse than that. You know, if someone near to you dies or there's some, some major kind of family emergency, you can just feel that, that there's nothing worse than that. And then it's, it's hard, you know, and we can sometimes see even larger catastrophes, some natural disasters, for example. And we have some ability to emotionally resonate with that and mm. to, to kind of you know reach into our wallets and try to help you know pay for charities that are working to help people in need from these calamities but when it comes to things that could kill a million times as many people as are killed in a natural disaster you know which is on our TV screens every night it's just hard to, to you certainly can't care about it a million times as much it's just not possible for the, the human brain. So it is a real challenge. A good example would be when there was serious concerns about a nuclear confrontation with North Korea and the United States. Mm, yeah. A lot of the, the writing about that in the media treated it as synonymous with the type of nuclear exchange that we were worried about with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. But really, at that point, North Korea just had a few nuclear missiles that would be able to reach the US. And so it was, you know, I say in inverted commas, merely a case that the US would lose a couple of cities. And in any normal sense, the idea that some of the Pacific Coast cities would be completely destroyed by nuclear weapons, you know, it, you don't need to go beyond that. That is, that is you know, right. as bad as it needs to get to just be like, we cannot possibly allow this to happen. But it still is a long way away from destroying the US or a long way away from destroying every country in the world. Um, and destroying not just every country in the world in the present, but the entire future of every place you know that there will ever be. And perhaps making it so there is no longer any place in the universe where, you know, where there is admiration of beauty or, or love or or any of these kind of higher emotions. So 
it really is a challenge uh, to keep these levels separate. And for a lot of purposes, you don't need to distinguish. You just need to say, yeah, look, that's too much and we, we can't under any circumstances allow it. And in a lot of cases, that is the right approach. And to some extent, people might think there's a kind of weird obsession that I or others have with these things that are <laughs> that are a thousand or a million mm-hmm. times bigger than, than needs to be called a catastrophe. But I don't think so. And I think that this is because there are special types of approaches that are needed to deal with these things. And because they're like one example is that if there is an existential catastrophe that that permanently would destroy humanity's potential, that's the kind of thing we can't allow to happen even once in the entire future of our species. And that we've lasted so far for 200,000 years or mm. 10,000 generations, where the, the torch has been you know, handed from generation to generation, and we've built up you know, this huge wealth of knowledge and culture and our institutions to give us all better lives uh, than we'd had so long ago. But if our generation were to fail that, then instead of having another 10,000 or more generations to come, you know, there'd just be nothing. And so because we can't learn from trial and error on this, because even one error is just too many, it's game over, it creates this kind of unique ways of having to deal with it. And if we don't really take this seriously and we just treat it the same way as, as other catastrophes, I don't think we'll be prepared to make the the changes that we might need to make to to mm. our uh, our lives or our sovereignty or things like this in order to deal with this issue. So I'm curious if you spent any time looking at the history of, I don't know what you would call it, doomsday predictions or fears, societal fears around the end of the world. Because although with the advent of nuclear weapons and the beginning of the Cold War, I think humanity first experienced a very clear sense of total catastrophe that it couldn't have practically had in the past. There were periods in the past where societies were small enough and floods and things like this could basically destroy what they conceived to be their world. And I'm curious if you spent any time kind of looking at that and what that might tell you about the importance that we ascribe to the continuation of the species. Hmm. So there are a couple of different things going on here. So one of them is this question about a kind of smaller scale end of everything that you know of, or like the end of the known world or Mm. something like that. And that gets into the question of collapses of civilizations. And there are people who study this. For example, there's quite a lot of interest in that at the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk, uh, CESA, where people are, are looking into... Uh, the historical record, you know, how long on average have civilizations lasted? Um, what does the kind of decay rate look like? Is it that they have an aging effect where the older they are, the more likely they are to perish? Or perhaps the older they are, the more likely they are to survive for another year? In fact, the track record on that suggests that actually the chance of failing in the next year is independent of how long it's been alive so far. Mm. So there's something like a half-life the of approach these civilizations. So there's some very interesting and intriguing things there. I haven't looked into them so much uh, for the reason that it's unclear exactly how relevant it ends up being to the question of existential risk. Because these civilizations were extremely small by the global scale of today, we're talking about things such as ancient Egypt failing or the fall of Rome or you know things like this, which were you know kind of world shaking uh, at the time, or at least you know a very major disruption around mm. the Mediterranean. But in a world where there are billions of people living on other continents, it, it's not the kind of you know the, the Nile River drying up is not the kind of thing that would destroy humanity. And often it's because they were conquered by some other group, which is not going to happen to the entire world. So it's often only a very weak analogy, but it is intriguing and interesting, and I encourage people to look into it. But I'm not sure exactly how much we can learn from it because we're talking about it, you know, groups of often hundreds of thousands of people or or a million people, rather than something that's thousands of times larger than that, and spread over the entire world. But the other interesting question that you brought up is about the the history of thought about the end of the world, and that's something where my colleague Thomas Moynihan has done amazing work. He's written a book called X Risk, and it's about the history of ideas behind existential risk. And that Mm. was very eye-opening for me because I didn't know a lot of this. And 
he charts a lot of these ideas about the end of the world and finds that that up until very recently, they were all in a very religious context. Hmm. And the religious ideas about the end of the world are just very different to the naturalistic scientific questions about whether we'll survive. It's much more of a kind of moralistic question in a sense of that there's some grand narrative playing out and that often that narrative ends you know, with a kind of preordained destruction of the world. Hmm. But it's not the idea that it could just be disrupted, you know, that due to bad policy choices made <laughs> that we end up allowing a nuclear war. They see it as part of the larger cosmogenic cycle. Exactly. Rather than a kind of accident or kind of contingency that could happen that you need to guard against, it's instead the final battle or something. And it's also generally preordained who will win that battle. So it doesn't produce the same kind of questions about thinking about policy choices or thinking about you know whether the UN should be doing more about this or something. It just doesn't really engage with those types of questions. And it wasn't a scientific type of inquiry. So even though there were a very large number of predictions made about this that have all been wrong, I don't think that bears very much on the modern scientific field, any more than a whole lot of predictions about alchemy you know, bear on chemistry. Yeah. Past performance is not an indicator or predictor of future returns, as they say. Indeed. So is there a case in which the collapse of civilization itself could constitute an existential event, either because the collapse eventually brought about an existential event, or in other words, the end of the species itself, or because the collapse created an unrecoverable loss of the things that make us human, I, I suppose? Because there's mm -hmm. part of this is you get into evolutionary issues as well. I mean, both on the upside and on the downside. So how do you think about that? So I do think that this could happen. So the way that I define an existential catastrophe is something that destroys humanity's long-term potential. So I think of humanity's long-term potential in terms of everything that we could currently achieve so if you look at all of the worlds that are open to us, if only we were to get our act together on certain things, and if we were to strive towards certain ends, what could we make of the earth? What could we make of the universe around us? What are all of these different things that we could do? And then our potential is good as the best thing that we could do. And this is the common sense understanding, I think, in terms of like a child's potential is uh, if you think of all of the lives open to her, it's the best kind of possibilities that still remain open. And just as an event could happen to a person where their potential all of a sudden drops down to a very small amount, perhaps because they die prematurely, or perhaps because they suffer from some terrible non-lethal thing, such as becoming a quadriplegic, where all of a sudden their universe of possible lives is restricted to a much smaller and less satisfactory set. So that's how I think of an existential catastrophe. And the most natural one is, is extinction, where there's nothing we can do. There's no more choices anymore. And we basically just get zero value or, you know, at every time after that. But there's also these possibilities such as a, an unrecoverable collapse of civilization where there are perhaps a thousandth as many people living very meager lives with much fewer opportunities open to them. And if we couldn't get back from that, then I think most of our potential would be squandered and thus it would count as an existential catastrophe itself. And it, it would eventually lead to extinction. Although you can't just think of everything that, event, you know, we will, I assume with probability around about 100%, we will go extinct at some point in the future. The question is how much we manage to achieve or do before that point. Now, when it comes to the collapse of civilization in particular, I think it's quite likely that it would be restored. I mean, I think it's quite difficult to collapse. The Black Death killed about one in three people in Europe. And that Europe recovered very quickly from that. There weren't, you know, nations that permanently failed due to this. And civilizations didn't collapse despite this very large death toll. And, you know, they, they didn't go back hundreds of years in terms of their technology or anything like that. So we know that we are fairly robust, but we don't know what would happen if 90% of people died in some calamity or 99%. And I do think that there is a real possibility that we could lose our civilization and, and kind of be reduced to some pre-agricultural state. But even then, I think we're hopeful that we could get back from that because we know that civilization was actually created five different times independently in different parts of the world. 
So I think that there is a lot of hope that we could come back, but it still does loom large because it's also extremely difficult for us to go extinct. And maybe it's if you have a, a massive catastrophe such as a global nuclear war, and maybe we're 10 times more likely to have a collapsed civilization than to be extinct. But there's also maybe a 90% chance that we, we recover from that collapsed civilization. So overall, I think that maybe they contribute roughly equally to the, the possibility of existential catastrophe, uh, but for these different reasons. Are there any thought experiments that you considered where the cataclysm is so great that it, let's say, reduces the amount of energy available to the planet to a degree where people can survive, but they can survive in an increasingly devolved form, where maybe we simply don't have the energy intake to support these large brains, and that a more adaptive species comes about, devolves in a sense from humanity, that survives, but is no longer actually able to create civilization. And that maybe you know, a highly intelligent being like human beings is an aberration. It isn't a, a natural mm -hmm. process along the evolutionary ladder. So I think it's pretty difficult to end up in a world like this where where something happens that makes it almost impossible to recover civilization, but it's difficult to rule it out. Mm. So if we completely destroyed our climate over and that that damage was lasting over say tens of thousands of years, you know, suppose it, it things got 10 degrees hotter and that that lasted for tens of thousands of years. Well, that, you know, maybe we couldn't restore civilization in that mm. situation because that our past track record of achieving it several times, none of those perhaps were, were in climates as bad as that. Mm -hmm. So maybe it really would be impossible to come back. Some people think that resource depletion could be one of these where we used the easily accessible fossil fuels on our way up, but we might not be able to do that again. So something along those lines. Although when you look into it, I don't think that the argument works because it turns out that there are massive amounts of fossil fuels in strategic oil reserves and coal reserves and open coal mines where we've already actually excavated down to the level of the coal and so on. And there's, you know, while we've used a lot of the easily available iron ore, there's just a vast amount of iron and steel in terms of the buildings and structures and ultimately turning the rusted iron railings of Mayfair into new iron tools is easier than doing it from iron ore. Mm. Uh, so it's it's difficult to actually, I think, get a scenario where resource depletion causes this. But I wouldn't be shocked if there are realistic scenarios that I don't yet know of, whereby we could indeed get stuck for something that, that kind mm. of knocks us down and holds us down. So I want to bring us back to your observation about human potential and ask the question why it's important. In other words, why is it important to fulfill human potential? Because you could make the argument, you know, Heraclitus, man is the measure of all things. The value that we ascribe to humanity and its continuation is, again, arguably entirely subjective to humanity. And without humanity there to judge that value, why would it matter? Yeah. So I think that that type of argument is very similar to the Epicurean argument that death isn't bad mm. because without you being there to experience it, it can't be bad. You know, the, the idea is that my death isn't bad for me now while I'm alive because I'm alive. And then once I'm dead, it wouldn't be bad for me then because there'd be no me for it to be bad for mm -hmm. or something like that. And it sounds like there's a similar kind of idea that, that things are good or bad in as much as we judge them so but we wouldn't be there in that future to judge it as bad. I think there's a couple of things you could say to that. One is that I think the Epicurean argument is not a very good one. It might be a bit of a puzzle to see exactly what's going wrong with it, but no one really believes it. You don't see uh, health policies being set by people saying, well, it just doesn't matter if our patients die. It's bad if they suffer discomfort because they're still there to suffer it, but it doesn't matter if they die, so we just, you know, we let them die. No one would take that seriously as a as a policy. No one would vote for a party that that said, you know, well, also not because try the to death of other people impacts us. It does, but I don't think we would really want to go there either because that would say that death of people who have no no loved ones or people around them, you know, just doesn't matter, which is another way of saying that we ultimately do care empirically yes. about whether we live or die. Indeed. I'm just trying to suggest that while there's some kind of philosophical interest about this kind of Epicurean argument, 
we don't really buy it. And kind of no one really buys it because of these kinds of consequences that it would have. We, you know, we think what's wrong, you know, if a homeless person is allowed to die from an easily preventable thing is that they lose their life. Like everything that could have come beyond that for them, they'll never get to fulfill like their hopes and dreams. There'll be a lot less of, you know, what makes a good life. And instead of having a, a longer life with more of fulfillment, more achievement within it, they will have a shorter and thereby worse life rather than thinking that it's not bad for that person at all. It's just, a, you know, it could be an inconvenience for people who mourn them. I think that that is really not how we think about death and that this argument can be a solace in times of grief or, or times when we're scared of dying. It shouldn't be treated as an action guiding kind of way to set policy. And I think that's something similar when it comes to the end of humanity. If we took seriously this idea that there's nothing bad about it because we're not there to do it, then, you know, global nuclear war might just be totally fine. Like there's no reason to avoid it at all. <laughs> you know, you can imagine someone running for office and saying, well, if things look like they were going to go bad, hey, don't worry, I've got this new policy. You know, if things go well, that's great. If they look like they're going to go bad, I'll just cause this kind of global nuclear war. And then that's not bad. So either way, it's not going to be bad. <laughs> you know, that, that would just be like insane as a, as a response. Mm. Uh, and I think when we think about it like this, we notice that this argument really isn't working. And then that's just from the outside to say, I think it's pretty clear the argument doesn't work. But if we want to then diagnose exactly what's going wrong with the argument, I think that the answer is that that we can judge these things from here. So just as it's bad, say, for an animal to suffer far away from me where I don't find out that it's suffering, and I can correctly judge that from here. Similarly, it's bad if we don't have a future. And even though I'm not in that future to judge it, I can judge it from the present. So I think that's taking this more timeless approach, I think, is the solution. And I think it's also the solution for the Epicurean argument, where instead of looking at any one time and noticing you don't exist in that time to, for it to be bad for you, you instead look at your life as a whole, like spread out across time, and notice that the life where you die prematurely is shorter and has less of what's good in it, mm. whereas the other life is longer and has more of what's good. You know, there's a movie that I can't remember the name of it, where corporations or one corporation in particular creates a, what is effectively a suicide medication. And because the world, it might have been children of men, mm -hmm. and the world had gotten so bad that people electively began to kill themselves. And we have seen this before with like cults and other groups where there are sort of mass suicides. Also, in situations where civilizations or societies were overtaken by a horde of invaders, many of the women would throw themselves off of cliffs rather than to be raped. In other words, humanity also shows a, a willingness to accept suicide and, and the end over suffering, which I think mm -hmm. is interesting. I also, you know, to kind of exhaust this line of reasoning, there's also an argument that one could make, and many do make it, that the world would be better off without us, that we've actually contributed more to suffering in terms of the totality of life on Earth than we have in terms of all the benefits that we've created through our own existence. What do you say to that argument that the world would actually be better off without us, so we should just go ahead and start dying sooner than later? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think there's something to the argument. I mean, ultimately, I reject it, and I'll try to explain why. But I think it's good that people are noticing that there are harms that humanity is causing, harms to other humans, such that there are questions about, is the balance of human happiness positive or negative, given that, that some of us cause tremendous suffering to others? And also, it's good that we're asking these questions about the balance of human harms to things other than humanity. So harms to individual animals and the, the welfare or well-being of these animals, or violations of their rights. And also, perhaps environmental harms that are not to a particular individual, such as the loss of species. So I think that, in my view, if you weighed this up, it would come out as positive, but it's hard to know. And relatively few people try to do a, a clear reckoning of it. I think that most typical people you know, around the world have good lives. And one of the reasons that we can kind of check that is by this thing that you mentioned before about the possibility of suicide, that if people were having truly wretched lives where the continuation of their life was worse than nothing, that there are at least ways for them to end it and find some way out, but that doesn't happen so much. But it, there's pretty bleak thinking about this. But 
I think that's more plausible when one considers things like factory farming, depending on mm. these very difficult questions about how exactly does you know an hour of suffering in the life of a chicken compare to an hour of anything in the life of a human. I don't think that's an easy question at all. But it's at least plausible, since there are so many animals that we're hurting, that we could be making things at the moment. We're doing more harm than good. But the way I see it is that that answer to that question, are we currently producing more harm than good? is not that closely connected to the question of is our potential you know zero or is the expected amount of good in the in the future zero uh, our contribution and the reason is that is because of moral progress that we have made a tremendous amount of progress if we look back you know 100 years and find that uh, that there was you know very few places where women had the vote you know and where there was just very unequal treatment for different groups. And, you know, we'll go back a, a few hundred years and see slavery be much more commonplace and, and accepted mm. and almost no concern for animals or the environment. We can see that, that however bad things are at the moment or however challenging they are and how, however far we have still to go, we've come a long way. And I see every reason for, for this progress to be able to continue. And here's how I see the wider question about, you know, should we end it all? I often think of a useful analogy uh, for humanity to imagine it in terms of an individual human life. It's not a perfect analogy, but I think it's instructive. So if we think about a typical mammalian species, they last about a million years. And Homo sapiens has lasted so far for about 200,000 years, uh, suggesting about 800,000 years to go. Uh, I think we should be able to do even better than that for various reasons. But that would put us in our adolescence, a kind of teenager within this life. And I think that, that there's a lot of things pointing to that as a useful analogy, that we're, hmm. how we've finally just become powerful enough uh, to really get ourselves in trouble, uh, like, like the adolescent, hmm. uh, without yet having achieved the wisdom to, or the patience uh, to, to notice that on this scale, every election cycle is just four hours. And, you know, for the sake of the next four hours or, or maybe a generation, which is just like a day, and for the sake of, you know, getting some minor benefits for the people, you know, of our time, we're willing to, uh, to potentially risk the entire rest of our life. And so I think this is a useful analogy. And then when it comes to this question of, is the future going to be worth living? I think that's a bit similar to the question of an adolescent who, who is feeling depressed and, and anxious about their future and that maybe they don't know whether their future life will be worth living and they're feeling suicidal and they think maybe the world, you know, mm. it would be better for them if they ended it all or maybe it would be better for others. Maybe they're feeling remorse at, at treating someone badly and it's just burning them up and they think that they're worse than nothing and they want to end it all. And, and I find that useful because if we think about an individual like that, I think we'd be very sympathetic to them. Uh, we'd understand where they're coming from. But by the same token, we would think that you really shouldn't judge your whole future by how you're feeling at a time when something bad's happened to you. You should weigh that in just as much as you weigh in the, the better times as well. And also the fact that someone is starting to feel remorse for something they did and to really notice that there are times when they hurt those around them that's a positive sign for them actually learning how to mm. how to improve and how to take the interests of others more seriously and to care for others. And so I think that the right action or the right response to that wouldn't be, I think I hurt everyone around me, so I'm going to end it all. It would be, I'm going to stop hurting everyone around me. I'm going to try to work out how to do that and how I can really make the world a better place. Like That would be the right response. And I think that's the right response for humanity as well. We should say, it's terrible that it's even a question as to whether we could have negative value overall. But let's not uh, treat that as a reason to have zero contribution to the world. Let's treat that as a wake-up call to get our act together and make sure that, you know, that our children's generation, you know, that no one will even be able to question whether we're having a, a positive impact. That's beautiful, Toby. You know, your love for people really comes across in the book. I think it's actually really powerful. I mean, the, the book seems to be about existential risks, but as I said to you before we turn on the microphones, towards the very end, the last two chapters maybe, but certainly the last one, it really becomes clear that this book is as much if not more about your love for humanity, and it's a meditation on the value of humanity. 
and the human experience. So let's shift now into a conversation about the risks that you outline. First of all, how did you go about choosing these risks? So as I explained at the start, I, I've been following along with existential risk as a, for you know, a long time now, almost, you know, I think, 16 years. And I've really uh, you know, been listening carefully to a lot of these debates. And when, when new things get suggested as risks, trying to really understand them and, and to dive into the science and talk to leading figures in these areas and find out you know, whether they really do pose a risk to humanity. And the Future of Humanity Institute has, has been doing this for a long time, set up by Nick Bostrom. And so that has been helpful to try to get a rough working list of what are the types of things that, that could plausibly be the end for humanity. But then it's also very difficult within that to try to have some idea about which ones are the bigger risks and which ones the smaller. There are some that I only say about a paragraph about in the book. For example, we, we sometimes hear that the, the Earth occasionally reverses its magnetic field, where the north and south pole of the, the magnetic poles of the Earth switch around. And in between, there's a period where we're not protected from some of the cosmic rays. And you might think, you know, and it's often suggested that that could be an extinction risk. But the scientific evidence on that one suggests that it really isn't. It's happened multiple times since humans and chimpanzees evolutionarily diverged. And it's something that species survive a great deal and that there's no known correlation between species extinction and the times when the poles have reversed. So we can kind of rule it out. But there are others where, where it is more plausible, and I've tried to focus on those. When it comes to the natural risks, such as this would be if it really was a risk, we've got the benefit of data. If you're trying to think about probabilities, the best way, if you can do it, is to try to get access to frequencies. So to say, how many times has something like this happened over the last million years? And then if you've got enough times, you know, you can start to get a bit of confidence in the probabilities. So for example, we have some pretty good confidence in terms of how often is the Earth hit by an asteroid at various different sizes. Whereas it was a 10 kilometer radius asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And there hasn't been another one at that size you know, in the last 65 million years. So that is very helpful to us to see that there were you know, 65 of these 1 million year periods in a row without it happening. And we can start to get a grip on, on the chances. But when it comes to the, the anthropogenic risks like nuclear war, we've only survived 75 years since the development of nuclear weapons. And that track record is not enough to really tell us that much about the probability. That's compatible with the probability being 90% or the probability being zero. You know, Each of those could fit it not happening in 75 years. 90% per century, I should say. If it was 90% per year, that would be ruled out you know, by surviving 75 years. But ultimately, I like to think of them as the chance per century. And uh, we learn very little from such a short track record. So it's much harder and much more judgment call required to try to sort out the anthropogenic risks. Does that mean that extinction events associated with anthropogenic risk factors inherently carry more a higher margin of error so that, I mean, because your extinction of the likelihood of an extinction event mm -hmm. related to anthropogenic risk was, according to you, much greater than natural risk. So how much of that was actually because these risks are so new and we have so little data on them? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So in the book, I try to estimate these risks, but I ultimately can't do so completely objectively. What we like to have in science is a situation where any intelligent observer who'd looked at the same data would have to kind of form a judgment of the probability that was very similar to each other. We could think of that as a really objective measure. Whereas in this case, there is evidence that we can all agree on, but we, you know, there's room for people to have very large disagreement about what actual chance of, uh, of catastrophe there would be. And in the case of a lot of these risks, there's that something like a factor of 10 difference between experts. So for example, my best guess for the chance of an existential catastrophe due to nuclear war in the next 100 years is about one in a thousand. But some of my peers you know, might say one in a hundred or mm. one in 10,000 to give an idea. And so 
But usually, if people are disagreeing by a factor of 10, <laughs> that's very bad news for your estimate. Mm. But in this case, even if we don't know whether it's more like 1% or more like 1 in 10,000, we know that it's much, you know, either of those would be much more likely than uh, extinction at the hands of an asteroid, where we know much more about it. What do you think, for context, and I think this will help listeners, what do you think the risk of nuclear war was in 1950? So, if you were doing the exact uh, same calculation without and replaying it, right? Yeah. Not necessarily knowing what the outcome would be. I imagine you would you would have put the risk much higher. And then the question is, is that partly a reflection of the general mood at the time, which was very apocalyptic around nuclear weapons? Or is that also because it legitimately was higher because these weapons were newer and we were just beginning to grapple with their awesome potential for destruction? So, yeah, there, there are a couple of things going on there. So one is that that my one in a thousand estimate is not for the chance of a nuclear war in the next hundred years. It's for the chance of a nuclear war that destroys humanity's entire potential going forward. And I- All Right, this I gets us might... back to the alignment between existential yeah. risk and really awful, awful outcomes. <laughs> That's right. And the chance of a nuclear war that is exactly a really, really awful outcome, or even a dark age for humanity, you know, is substantially higher than one that manages to kill every single person, or that uh, that causes an absolutely permanent collapse of civilization. And so, it's comprised of the chance that we end up suffering a full-scale nuclear war, combined with the chance that that is our undoing. And so, when we think about the 20th century. Yeah, my best guess is something like a one in three hmm. chance that there would have been a full-scale nuclear war. I really think that if you look at the details, and the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62 was the closest that I think we've got to nuclear war, there were a large number of close calls in a couple of weeks. And yeah, JFK, who was the, the president at the time, he retrospectively thought that there was between a, a one in three and a one in two chance that it would have turned into a full-scale nuclear war. And I think that that's about right. And so, you know, we've we've had some really close calls. In that case, even with that estimate, there were things, I think the closest call of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy didn't even know about, which was this Russian submarine that was carrying a nuclear torpedo and the captain ordered it to be launched against the uh, blockading US fleet. And if that had been launched and destroyed the entire fleet in nuclear inferno, then the only response that the US had to this was nuclear war. And they'd, they'd already said that any use of nuclear weapons would be met with a full and utter retaliation against the Soviet Union. And got very close to happening. The uh, Ultimately, the captain ordered it and uh, the political officer agreed. And there was only lucky that the flotilla commander, Vasily Arkhipov, happened to be stationed on that particular submarine and they needed his consent as well. And he refused to give it and, and talked the captain down and convinced them instead to surface and surrender. Mm -hmm. But you know, <laughs> there are things like this where the US didn't even know that there were tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba, either on the submarines or on the ground. So they were working with a lot less information and uh, they made bad threats and ultimatums on the assumption that it was only these strategic nuclear weapons that were involved. But you know, there's these fascinating episodes like this where I really do think that we got very close to nuclear war. Yeah, and if you sit and think about that, that's the word insane is not the right word. It's a combination of insane, horrifying, and you feel an incredible sense of not just good fortune to have survived, but then dread for what could come when we talk about these types of risks. So. How much have you considered, because game theory, again, is such mm -hmm. a big part of all this, because even, let's put aside the initial strike. Let's say that the initial strike happened. The follow-on strikes aren't, in some sense, necessary, but they are necessary in the context of the overall strategic game that's being played and the long-term calculations that would be made, in this case, by the JFK administration about what it would mean not to retaliate against a strike. Mm -hmm. So have you considered that in the context of where the world is today geopolitically, and in particular with respect to how the polarity of the global order is changing and the increased alliance between countries like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea against the US, which I would say not even against the US and the West, because Western alliances have 
significantly frayed. And it's not entirely clear how this is all going to shake out. And the weapons of the future, while of course nuclear weapons always loom large, and in my reading of the history, primarily because of the possibility of a mistake, that's the the it seems to be most likely way in which we would get a, a nuclear event or a war. But even more frighteningly, the development of new weapons, and this eventually gets us into a conversation about artificial intelligence and unaligned AI. So I'm curious how you think about that as a catalyst for the development or playing out of an existential event. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a lot there. You're right that there is a lot of places where game theory comes in. The game theory, in fact, behind the uh, American-Soviet nuclear postures was very complicated. There are various famous parts of it, such as this idea of mutually assured destruction, with this idea that you need to be able to commit to launching a retaliatory strike so severe that it would uh, destroy your adversary, and that once you've made that commitment, they won't attack you because it won't be worth their while to attack you, so they won't make a first strike. We've all heard about that, but that is only one piece. Uh, there, there are many different aspects of shifting game theory. There were times where the technologies were such that a first strike was dominant. It was like at the Wild West, where right. whoever kind of pulls their gun out first and shoots the other person. Theories of limited nuclear war. Kissinger worked on some of those in, at, when he was at Harvard, but they eventually dispensed of those in the 60s. Yeah, but there's also a worry that if, for example, everyone disarmed from nuclear weapons, that it could end up like that again, because a world without nuclear weapons, there could be an onus if another geopolitical tension arrives for one side to quickly develop mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and then shoot first before the other side can develop weapons to retaliate. Mm -hmm. And so that game theory is kind of still lurking around. That, that we forged an equilibrium of sorts. Yeah. And another example is that there was a period where any nuclear weapon fired against an ICBM would you know, destroy... You, you send a missile and you destroy at most one other missile if you get it to land on the ICBM before it's launched. And it destroys it despite the hardening of the fortifications. But then when they developed these MERV weapons, multiple independent re-entry mm. vehicles, each nuclear missile could split into a number of warheads, which would then all land on independent targets in the, the enemy state. And that meant that if you fired first, you could destroy five missiles or more, depending on Insanity. this nerve Insanity. ratio. And then it all shifted back towards first strike again, because you could really limit the retaliation. So by creating this new technology, which they thought, you know, Individually, it benefited each country to develop it, but then it changed the strategic landscape and actually incentivized their opponents to strike them and incentivized you know, this to happen even at a kind of relative peace time in order to uh, have this bolt out of the blue attack in order to, to you know, remove your adversary from the risk of nuclear war in the future. So this shifted so many times and that was a really eye-opening thing to me. And it made me realize that it is extremely difficult as an outsider to know. And a lot of the times when they create a new defensive technology, it turns out the defensive technology, you know, for example, suppose that there was an impervious missile shield that was mm. possible to create. Then there's an incentive for your opponent to strike before you complete it. Yeah, well, um, that was one of the arguments against SDI in the 80s, that Reagan was going to effectively exactly. destroy mutually assured destruction as a form of deterrence, of mutual deterrence, and we would end up getting a nuclear war exactly because we had the ability to theoretically prevent one. Exactly. So it's very confusing. And there's a whole lot of possibilities for well-intentioned uh, interventions to actually make things worse, which is a real challenge. I think that, uh, I guess, a recommendation I would make is ultimately that uh, we should get rid of the ICBMs. And uh, I agree with arguments that have been made that it's even worth the US just unilaterally getting rid of its ICBMs, possibly replacing them with additional submarines, because the submarines have unknown locations and right. are very hard for the opponent to take out. So they could still present a credit threat. But then you would remove this issue of the use it or lose it aspect of ICBMs, where you potentially right. have to launch even when you just suspect that there's a strike on its way, because if you wait too long, it'll hit you. And that's the kind of issue where these MERV weapons actually made things worse, because they made it so that you had to launch on warning, right. uh, so-called hair trigger alert, rather than being able to confirm that there really was an attack before you launch them. So I think this the game theory is, is very complicated and it's very hard for, yes, for people who are not in the strategic establishment kind of privy to the current classified information to know what actually would help. But by the same token, 
I don't trust the people who are to get these things right because they tend not to be experts in things like existential risk and whether whether there, it is legitimate to threaten a full-scale nuclear war in exchange if there was any nuclear attack on your soil, if by doing so you're effectively threatening you know, genocide of the entire world over all time. It seems like that would be impermissible by any reasonable sense, even as a measure of self-defense, even if you don't intend to actually go through with it. Uh, so, sorry, or you know, as in you don't expect to have to go through with it because you don't think that anyone's going to strike you. I think the whole situation of mutually assured destruction is like a climax of an action film where you know the protagonist and the antagonist each have, like, say, the child of the other person who they're kind of holding hostage under one arm with a gun to their head, and they say, you know, don't shoot me, or you know, I'm going to shoot your child. It's a bit like that. Uh, they're ultimately threatening to murder the citizens, like, t- you mm. know. Uh, murder millions or hundreds of millions of citizens in the other country who were you know who are not combatants if they were attacked which is you know against uh, the geneva convention it's against you know all any reasonable understanding of the laws or ethics of war or even just our kind of basic understanding you know basic humanity and you could kind of imagine that holding for a moment like the climax of the film there's a couple of tense minutes of standoff and then somehow the tension's relieved and the hostages get released mm. back to the other side and you know maybe the baddie escapes into their helicopter and you know that you know, we live to fight another day or something but instead you know it's 75 years later and there's still this kind yeah. of active threats to murder the citizens of the other country if someone does anything to you it's really shocking and i don't know that the military or strategic establishments really take seriously just how morally wrong this stance could be. Well, that's like one of the misconceptions. The, the point you made about ICBMs is a good one because one of the common misconceptions by people is that if, let's say, the Soviets were to strike first and knock out enough ICBMs, that that would significantly diminish or entirely impair our ability to respond. But that's what the nuclear triad is about. That's why we have mm-hmm. multiple ways to launch missiles. And arguably, it's really the nuclear subs that give us that, that capability to be able to attack anywhere at any time, and it simply be impossible for any adversary to take out all of them. That's right. I think the best counter response to that, if I were to, to imagine my opponents, uh, and I think the, the best argument against dismantling just unilaterally most of these ICBMs, I guess it's even better if you could push for a bilateral disarmament rather than giving up your bargaining chip. But the US is not trying either of those. No, the opposite, armament. actually. The new START treaty is about to expire. Well, the, the new start has been renewed now. Oh, it has been um, renewed. I thought it was. Yes. Oh, interesting. So it, it came up for renewal. Uh, so I thought it was in, extended think, until 2021, but. That's right. And it was the, I think it came up within the first month of the Biden administration. Oh, interesting. I didn't notice that. Trump had planned to let it lapse. So Biden came in and re-signed it. I can't remember how many years extension it has, but it's back again. Oh. So that's good news. But the. Yeah, the best thing I think someone could say against this approach of just rely on the submarines is what if the technologies change again? What if, uh, say, submarine drones, what if we can release enough of those into the ocean that they can find the enemy subs and just trail them and yeah. so you know where they all are? Or what if you know new forms of satellite surveillance you know, detecting things under the oceans you know, could do this or something similar? If such a technology arose then all of a sudden you might know and be able to kind of neutralize your opponent's counter-strike facilities. And it might be that, I don't know if this is true or not, but it might be that then it tips it back towards first strike balance. And so I guess it would. And so maybe that would then increase the chance of war again. I don't know how likely any of that is, but it's just to show that it is very complicated. And I think that the military establishment have kind of abused that complication by telling others to you know butt out because you don't understand it's all very difficult but they haven't sought the advice from people you know such as people thinking about ethics or or related areas yeah and yeah so they've just got one part of the puzzle and often we just have you know some other part of the puzzle and it's very difficult to solve it with just this one part when I mean, you kind of need to put them all together but that isn't really happening it's terrifying that there are systems in place controlled ultimately by human beings. Actually, to be honest, I'm glad they're controlled by human beings versus being controlled by machines, which is, that's another fear, right? Mm -hmm. Because there again, to bring it back to the game theory, there are a lot of incentives pushing countries, particularly the US and China, which have the resource to make these investments, to invest in and develop autonomous weaponry and increasingly rely on AI in order to guide decisions in the field. 
And one reason is also because, and putting, you know, not just AI, but ro robots, because that also mm -hmm. reduces not only the risk of bodily harm to pilots and people that are actually, you know, I say pilots because drone warfare is kind of on the cutting edge, but really reduces the likelihood that, of human error for a lot of these, you know, on small scale. But of course, that it creates then, you know, larger existential risks. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And again, it's another area where it's very difficult to get it right without access to a lot of the facts and argumentation around lethal autonomous weapons, because we sometimes forget as civilians that all military, well, you know, a very large amount of military technology is about enhancing the lethality of your weapons. That happens every day, mm. and uh, there's not normally that much discussion about it. And that the idea of weapons that mean that you could use them without fear of reprisal, that's been going for a long time mm. as well. You know, as soon as the, the bow and arrow was invented, you know, it's a way of trying to kill your a foe without being at risk yourself. Yeah. So things like, there's a lot of these things that we tend to think, oh, drones are special because they have this new property, and it turns out that, that that's very common. And it's entirely plausible that the more sophisticated versions of drones will indeed have fewer examples of civilian casualties because they'll be able to target better than they're, what they're replacing. For example, if you think about the war in Kosovo, that was often just dumb bombs being dropped from high altitude. And a drone is indeed you know, more able to, uh, to distinguish a civilian from a combatant than a bomb is. So even though they have flaws, they could be better at some of these things. But... I think you've, you've put your finger on the, the key issue, which is this kind of precipitousness of these automated systems to escalate, that they, in the same way that with nuclear weapons, they meant that it was possible to at least cause millions of deaths and possibly the end of humanity just, you know, just by one person's choice or something like that. This kind of like hierarchy right. or pyramid of command got so great that just kind of one bad choice could immediately set this thing in motion and it, where it could be unstoppable. And that there's a similar aspect of a kind of precipitousness where if you automate more and more right. of these kind of swarms of drones and perhaps the strategic command for them and so on, that you could find yourself very quickly, instead of in some skirmish or a kind of tit for tat against, you know, one of their drones shot down one of yours, so you want to shoot down one of theirs just to say that's that, we're even again. It could turn that response, you know, into something that brings the nations into war. So I do agree that that is one of the biggest right. problems. Yeah, there is a relationship between scale and stability that isn't necessarily favorable for reducing existential risk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, it also. I'm also reminded of that quote by Sagan. I think you quote him in the book, but if I remember correctly, it's something along the lines of how many of the dangers that we face result from having become powerful without having become commensurately wise. Exactly. That was definitely a, a guiding thought from uh, Carl Sagan that was very much in my mind while I was writing the book. Yeah. And that one thing that, that strikes me that when I was thinking about with conventional weapons or could one end up in the same kind of situation where one mistake, you know, could you mistakenly end up in a war? And I guess, you know, there are examples, right? So arguably World War One sure. was a kind of mistaken entrance to war. But another, I think, really interesting example that not many people know of is the... Um, FDR accidentally calling on like that Japan would require their unconditional surrender. This was a case where he was, I think, with Churchill making a radio broadcast, I think from Casablanca and near the end of uh, World War II. And it was just an error. He script, he was meant to say, call for the surrender. And then just added this word unconditional in there, which turned out to be a complete game ender or something for, for the Japanese. They weren't willing to Put up with that at all because they thought it would mean the end of the emperor and so they were particularly focused that it couldn't be an, or a call for an unconditional surrender they'd only surrender conditionally and yeah fdr just said the wrong thing on a radio broadcast and then uh, churchill stupidly decided to back him up on it because he he has some list his thing in his you know autobiography that he thought they need to be consistent, the two leaders of these great powers. So he also you know, redoubled this call for the unconditional surrender of Japan. And that actually ended up being the policy. So how much has any work been done to sort of 
evaluate whether or not we would have actually dropped two nuclear weapons onto Japan had that mistake not happened? As far as I understand, they would not have been dropped. And one of these questions about why on earth didn't Japan surrender? Why were they so dogged about this, leading to so many more Japanese deaths? And uh, a large part of the answer is this demand for unconditional surrender. They were a fascinating culture, the Japanese, pre-World War II. It's a very different society today than it was then. Indeed. But it's also fascinating that, that these Western leaders didn't just issue a statement after mm. that saying they should have had some kind of little, okay, hang on, let's just, okay, everyone else out of the room, you and I, let's have a conversation about this. Well, Do we actually mean this? Yeah. And we can be embarrassing to say actually to, you know, in one week to issue a clarification that you say, actually, we're no longer calling for the unconditional surrender or that that was an error. But it's even more embarrassing to lead to the deaths of what, I don't know how many thousands of US troops and how many millions of Japanese because of an you know a radio show error that you just doubled down on is that the thinking that it was a, it had to do with embarrassment because it seems to me one of the things that we lose sight of is that the operative environment in which human beings make decisions during war is dramatically different than during peacetime and we just simply have no ability to really imagine what that's like I mean, it's mm -hmm. very hard to imagine what it would have been like to have been president of the United States during such a critical period in time. And the amount of stress that creates. Also, FDR may, may well have thought that by issuing a corrective, that this would have exposed some level of confusion within his organizations, within his alliance structures, and that that would negatively impact the allies in their negotiations with the Japanese. And Maybe also they were willing to take a greater amount of risk once it was done. Yeah. It probably would have negatively impacted all of these things. You're, you're right. My guess is that it still should have indeed done yeah. it. And I'd hope that, you know, on the, you know, if they were seriously questioned about this after the war, I guess FDR didn't live to see that. Yeah. But that they would have, you know, admitted that this was this was a pretty terrible outcome and that they should have uh, they would have been better actually backtracking on it although i can see that if you say we demand this level of surrender and then you kind of change your mind and reassure well it's kind it doesn't of look kind of the, the obama red line in syria situation something similar yeah yeah moving your red line yeah. is not a good look but it's one thing that's interesting is to kind of say i wonder why that got so similar and part of the answer i think is this i guess the technology of uh, live radio broadcasts Ultimately, you know, back when you would have to kind of pen a thing that then would get sent by wire, you know, to a whole lot of different newspapers that would all print it out and so on, it was less easy to make this kind of mistake. But it, it, it's interesting, you do get this kind of possibility for one individual in command making just a mistake, like as in a, you know, flubbing something, not just that they make a bad choice. So, Toby, this so far has really been a really more, how would, how would I describe it? It's hard to describe a conversation like this as great, <laughs> but it's been um, much deeper and more eye-opening than I expected it to be. I thought that we were going to kind of have a chance to go through a number of these different risks in the course of the first hour. And in fact, we kind of spent our entire time on nuclear war and branching out from there, but not really getting into any natural risk much. I mean, we touched mm -hmm. on asteroids. I had written out, again, I put all the ones that I found were most interesting, asteroid impacts, supervolcanic eruptions especially, and also in terms of artificial risks or man-made risks, nuclear war was one of them. I also have written down AI, an AI singularity or some event related to misalignment, and of course, biological warfare, and also even just simply the development of pathogens in a lab that could be released by mistake. And this has happened before in cases that we know of. Um, and given the timeliness of the issue, I think that's something that we do want to focus on. So in, in I'm going to move the rest of our conversation into the overtime. I definitely want to get into artificial intelligence because I read mm -hmm. Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, and it was fascinating when I read it. It was really a, a terrifying meditation on all the ways in which not just society could end, but we would have a very bad outcome as a result of the challenges inherent in trying to develop artificial intelligence and the alignment problems and also the is ought gap you know the squaring our intentions with what the the ai actually understands them to be and biological warfare or pandemics i think those two are the most important that i want to touch on and then to the extent that we have time just based on 
the amount of time we've spent so far going through nuclear war. To the extent that we have time, I'd love to touch on supervolcanic eruptions and asteroid risks. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of my conversation with Toby, as well as the transcripts and rundowns to this episode and every other episode we've ever done, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library or subscribe directly through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hiddenforces. There's also a link in the summary page to this episode with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so you can listen to these extra discussions just like you listen to the regular podcast. Toby, stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation into the subscriber overtime. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.